At one time, the tall grass prairie stretched all the way from Texas to Canada. Today, less than 4% remains of that original prairie. Much of it is in the Flint Hills of Kansas. In order to preserve this national treasure, ranchers and rural landowners burn the prairie in the spring. It's a controlled burn, also called a prescribed burn. This burning of the prairie is what keeps it alive. There are many different reasons why prescribed burning is conducted in the Flint Hills. Well, you can use burning in a whole lot of ways. The timing in which you burn will help determine the degree at which you set back uh, that succession. Most of the burning in the Flint Hills occurs in April, early April, and that stimulates the grass, which is the reason why they're burning at that time of the year for, for livestock production. But if you're interested primarily in wildlife, can, you might consider burning at other times of the year, such as the early spring or, or even the late summer to stimulate more of those forbs, which again are critical for a food source, not only in the form of seeds, but also for the insects that they attract, uh, which are the primary food source during the, the summer months. Timing is really critical depending on your objectives. You can also use fire to, to move livestock around. We're very concerned about the loss of our native prairies here in Kansas. And the nice thing about it is, is that as we benefit grassland birds, we're actually benefiting the livestock industry at the same time. We burn in order to improve livestock performance. The average over a, we had a 48 uh, year period where we looked at this and we found out that it, it was uh, essentially 30 pounds more per steer. That adds value to that animal and in turn has the opportunity for that rancher to, to make a little more on those cattle and in turn, you know, funnel that out into the county and spend it in other ways. Throughout the Flint Hills, we're talking four million acres of native grasslands, and they probably take in uh, somewheres in the neighborhood of a million cattle every year that come in to graze. And so it's a big industry. It's a, it, it's a very big industry. So we burn, though, to maintain the grass and to maintain the prairie. Uh, it's more important for me that I make sure that no invasive species grow in and, and lessen the amount of grass that I have. There has been a lot of woody encroachment of trees and shrubs brush, and so periodically we'll burn to try to set those species back. We'll try to keep them in check. Now we have ground cover year round, and, and so we have infiltration of water. We can replenish groundwater that way. And as far as water quality, even from the runoff standpoint, and also if keeping that in rangeland, um, we're not going to have as many pesticides and uh, things like that used, and fire is one of those tools without having to put a chemical out there. Now, in terms of, of burning, if you're, if you're going to enroll in CRP and you're going to put some land in the program, one of the things you have to be interested in is how do I maintain it? How do I, how do I continue to keep that permanent cover there in the state that it's in? And one of the tools in the tool chest to do that is fire, and fire does a very good job of it, and it does it much less expensive than letting it go and then having to cut it out manually. Yes, fire it has been used for, for weed control, including both herbaceous plants as well as, as woody plants. There are some species, I think, that, that come to mind in particular. Uh, things like buckbrush, one of our common shrubs. We know that, that fire, particularly in the late spring, once uh, buckbrush is leafed out, can, fire can be very effective in, in reducing stands of, of that species. Uh, although a single fire may not completely do the job, it may take repeated burning two or three years in a row. Some of the other plants that respond uh, very well would be eastern red cedar. You know, eastern red cedar is a non-sprouting species, so fire just about any time of the year uh, when the site will carry a fire can be effective on, on controlling eastern red cedar. Most of the prescribed burning in the Flint Hills occurs during late March and April. This large-scale burning can cause air quality concerns in urban areas because of the number of fires burning at one time. In the Flint Hills region of Kansas, the 30-day period where most of the burning occurs, there might be only 10 days or even less that you can burn. 
then you're further restricted by the fact that there are regulations which require that you do not burn such that smoke goes over a major highway or towards an airport. And so we're trying to do our best to uh, burn at times and under conditions that will reduce the potential for increased ozone formation in the metropolitan areas. Well, prescribed burning, um, the smoke that comes off the burning, um, there's some cons constituents in there that uh, are what we call the precursors to ozone particularly. Um, those are um, nitrous oxides and volatile organic compounds. Those are byproducts of combustion and those are, um, when those are released into the atmosphere in the presence of sunlight, there's a chemical reaction that occurs that produces ozone. And that's primarily been what we've been concerned with in the downwind metropolitan areas from the burning in the Flint Hills is seeing high ozone readings at our monitoring sites in Topeka, um, Wichita, Kansas City. Since ozone isn't emitted directly from anything, it's formed through a chemical reaction with nitrogen oxides and VOCs and heat, sunlight. Um, we see a lot of downwind formation of ozone, and so we'll see elevated ozone levels very early in the spring when we normally wouldn't see those elevated ozone levels based mainly on the meteorology, the, the hot sunny days that you'd really expect to see a high ozone level. We'll see elevated ozone levels from the Flint Hills burning in early April or late March when you wouldn't normally expect to see those kinds of ozone levels. Ground level ozone is a pollutant that is one of six pollutants um, for which EPA sets health-based standards. And the reason it's a concern is because when we have elevated ozone levels in the Kansas City region, um, people experience breathing problems. And it can be uh, especially dangerous for folks who have asthma, chronic bronchitis, and other respiratory illnesses. So we know that asthma affects 10% of the population. One out of 10 people have uh, this respiratory condition. Uh, it, it's manifested as coughing, uh, wheezing, labored breathing. And so 10% of the population is susceptible to this. Uh, in children, it can rise to as high as 20%. So one out of five people may be affected by the, the prescribed burning. Uh, when you burn uh, prairie grass, you develop particles, and they're called PM10 and PM2.5, depending on the size of the particles, and that, that's all of the particles that get into the air that can trigger asthma symptoms. Uh, very, very small particles can also cause cardiovascular problems, heart attacks and stroke and things like that from very small particles, because they can actually get into the bloodstream if you inhale them. There are strict regulations concerning air quality. Generally speaking, if if we get a lot of people burning in certain days of the year, usually it's towards the middle or end of April, and they get big plumes of smoke that are put in the atmosphere. If we have wind out of the southwest, out of the Flint Hills, that typically will drive smoke into the Kansas City metro area. If for some reason we have a, a, a front that comes through or a push from the northeast, you can push all that smoke back into the Wichita metro area. And so that, then it becomes a problem for them because they have guidelines with the EPA that they, they don't want to cross. So we're charged by the Congress with carrying out the Clean Air Act. It's one of the most important environmental protection laws that we Americans have put in place in the last 50 years. It's contributed tremendously to improving our health, our livelihood, we live longer because our air is cleaner, and it actually protects property too. Yeah, fire, fire produces smoke. So there's been a lot of work done in terms of monitoring that and, and keeping the fires on a level that it doesn't exceed EPA standards. It impacts Kansas City in that each year metro areas are allowed a certain number of exceedances. And so we expect to see high ozone levels in a really hot sunny July day. And you know there's only so much you can do when the meteorology is stacked against you in that way. But what those early season exceedances do is they sort of cut off our fourth high numbers. They increase our ozone levels early in the season so we don't have as much wiggle room later in the season when the, the meteorology would dictate that ozone levels are going to be high anyway. So what are people in urban areas doing to help reduce ozone levels? We have a very active air quality public education program that is focused on getting the public to take action to, to improve air quality. A lot of that is focused on trying to get people to drive less on high ozone days, to avoid the use of small gasoline engines, in other words, lawnmowers and weed eaters, because those uh, cause a disproportionate amount of pollution. So just getting the public to take those little steps it doesn't have to be a big life-changing action, just, you know, driving less, 
um, waiting a day or two to, to mow the lawn until the ozone alert has passed. That can have a big positive impact on air quality. Because of the concern for air quality in the urban areas, a Flint Hills Smoke Management Plan and website were created by the cooperative efforts of many people. We knew we had a lot of different players that we needed to learn from. And we were given the charge to go ahead and move forward and develop the plan. We pulled together a group of uh, probably 50 to 60 interested parties and it was also a, a smaller group that was tasked with the responsibility for actually writing the plan. By the end of uh, 2010, uh, we'd completed the task and, and the plan was, was complete and was adopted by the secretary. I was involved in um, discussing the smoke management plan when it was very first getting started. And I think the really uh, biggest importance in that is that it is farmers and ranchers working together uh, to avoid legislation or regulation. It's important that we're still able to take care of the prairie. These grasses are really important to me personally and, and to my industry as a whole. And so we need the uh, ability, the freedom, to be able to use fire on the prairie. So in order to maintain that freedom, we've got to show people that we're doing our best uh, to manage it and, and to use it in the proper way. Well, here is the uh, home page for the Flint Hill Smoke Management Plan. The, the web page was developed by the folks over at K-State Extension, and they, uh, they host the, the web page. And so this way a, a rancher can, you know, can make a, a more informed decision. He can, make a, he can have a better understanding of where his smoke and uh, the emissions from that fire are going to be moving. And it has various uh, tabs across the top that provide uh, links to information about the Flint Hills, about burning in the Flint Hills, practices that a, that a landowner or rancher could use to reduce uh, smoke impacts from their fires. Uh, it also has links to uh, other sites where they can gather information about uh, uh, whether the conditions are safe for burning on a given day. And then on the far right, uh, it has a link to the, uh, to the modeling tool. The, the main thing we look for on the website is uh, the wind direction. They have a, some graphics that you put in your location and the amount of acres that you will burn. And it has a little picture of where your smoke plume is going to go. And you just make sure that your plume is not going to go over an urban area. And if it is, they have some, some little warnings that come up that say that the, the burn is not advised at that time. We have the two days up here so that a rancher can look at the current day if he had planned on burning that day, but also can look at the next day. And if he happens to be in a county where for the current day the conditions are not good, that county shows up in red, if he looks on the, on the next day and sees that it's a, it's a better day, either a yellow day or a green day, then uh, hopefully he can delay for one day and, and burn on that better day. The smoke modeling tools are available from mid-March through April. We try to keep it out of the major metropolitan areas. We look at the smoke models to see if we're going to have adequate mixing height so the smoke will dissipate and get away, or if it's going to stay down low and, and just hang around a long time. We try to, to stay away from that if we can. When my husband and I discuss and we decide it's time to burn, that some, sometime this week we've got a few thousand acres we need to burn, we will go to the website for the smoke management plan and enter in what we'd like to burn that day. You can say how many acres, the location of it, and uh, it also asks you what level of grass there is. So is there a lot of regrowth? Is there not very much regrowth? And it estimates then how much smoke that you're gonna make. And then it takes into account the wind patterns. And so where will your smoke go? How much smoke are you going to create? The smoke management plan helps me to decide where I'm going to burn, which pasture, and how many acres. The National Weather Service also has products available for those who are planning a prescribed burn. We have a, a fire weather page where uh, producers can go out and take a look and see what the fire weather forecast is for the next couple of days and for the week. And that gives them kind of an idea to get their planning started. And then as they get closer and closer to their burn, we actually have some products that have actually have hourly data that they can start looking at, you know, is this actually gonna be a good day to actually light the match? 
You can also find out more information by attending prescribed burning workshops offered by many local agencies. There is indeed a, a prescribed burning workshops that are, that are offered uh, by K-State Research and Extension in cooperation with a no, number of other agencies, including wildlife and parks, the uh, conservation districts. I know that the Kansas Forest Service offers some training. You know, usually several of those put on each year, either on a county or a multi-county basis. Prescribed burning takes a lot of planning. Say a month or two in advance, we will try to determine which pastures we want to burn at which time in the burning season. We have a small window of opportunity, maybe three weeks or, or maybe even four weeks. We will try to, to strategize which pastures we want to burn early in the season. Uh, they may have more cool season grasses in them and we need to burn early to get a, a good burn on them and eliminate some of the cool season invaders. We also have a tendency to wait a little later in the brushier woody species pastures because we feel a, a good hot fire is more effective uh, later on the season to really do some good against the brushy species. So we'll try to decide in the order we'll do it but that is extremely flexible because there's a, a variables that you have to deal with. We also, probably a month or so in advance, we try to strategize on how much equipment we're going to have available to us, how many people, uh, the type of help we're going to have. You can burn five or ten times as much if, you if your neighbors are cooperating and you're working together. So we try to get all our all things ready because when we start, we don't have time to be thinking about those other things. We really try to pay attention to where our smoke is going to go and what impact that's going to have, not only on traffic, but also on um, metropolitan areas and people that aren't familiar with uh, smoke and fire. For more information, visit the smoke management website at ksfire.org. I do have a very deep uh, abiding love for the prairie and a passion to take care of it. People should visit a prairie right after a burn. I think folks should see a prairie and smell it right after a fire and see the blackened landscape and then come back a week later and see as the green starts to kind of spread across the ground and then come back a couple weeks later and it becomes a carpet of vegetation and just rich and full of color and then come back a month later and see just how beautiful and green it is. And I think once you experience it and you smell it and you touch it, you'll realize why the prairie um, needs fire. People who live in urban areas have a lot of air quality challenges. We know, for example, in Kansas City and Wichita, we're still not where we need to be in providing clean and healthy air for everybody who lives there. But I think when it comes to the smoke in the spring in that limited period of time, we're doing a better job every year of keeping that out of the equation. Keep in mind that Tallgrass Prairie is um, considered to be the most endangered ecosystem in North America. Something over 96, 97, 98 percent of the Tallgrass Prairie is now in cornfields or other uses. Fire is a necessary tool for maintaining grassland ecosystems. If we take it out of the picture, if we no longer burn, we will lose these grassland ecosystems flat out. There's just no way to maintain it without fire. If you totally eliminate fire from the landscape, and at some point in the near future, you're going to get to a point where these grasslands aren't going to be existed because they're going to be covered with red cedar or Osage orange. And if we want it to be here for the next generation and the next generation, then we got to do what Mother Nature did before we came here, and we've got to burn it quite often to keep the grasslands a grassland. So the ranchers in eastern Kansas are really kind of stewards of one of the last pieces of the most important ecosystem in North America. Well, that was unique for EPA because those tall grass prairies don't really exist any place else in the United States. Fire is very important in the prairie grasses. If there is no fire, there would eventually be encroachment of woody species. Fire is critical to prairie chickens and, and other grassland birds because it keeps those trees out of the prairie. If you do not burn, you end up getting woody encroachment out into those grasslands. And, and what that does is provide habitat for the, the predators that, that prey upon prairie chickens and other grassland birds. 
You can't mow it. You can't use a different type of practice to mimic fire. You might be able to do that some places, but not in the Flint Hills. You're, you're gonna, there's too many rocks and the terrain is too rough. And so fire is the only way to, to maintain it. And it's, it's too important of an ecological asset to lose.